in Jerusalem. And that was good. And so because he belongs to a culture that sees anything to happen as a result of a person, a personal cause, he wants to show that to everybody that it's his personal God, the God of his family, the God of David, that did this. The name of that God was the storm God of Yahweh. Now he asks, as king, a storyteller, a chronicle. We'll call him the Yahweh. He says, storyteller, come here. I want you to go to work, and I want you to write a story and explain, from the traditions of Israel, you're not making this up, explaining how it is that I became king. And so the storyteller went away, came back a little bit later. O king, live forever, he says. I will tell you how this happened. In Egypt, long ago, our ancestors were enslaved and humiliated. But God raised up a great champion, a great prophet named Moses. He did this so that your kingdom would be established. Moses liberated the people. All this for your kingdom. O king, live forever. David liked that story. David liked that story a lot. But David said, hey, wait a minute. Why did he, if he wanted me to be king... Why did he have our ancestors be slaves in the first place? What was that all about? So the Yahweh, the storyteller, went back to the drawing board. He starts writing again and thinking again, collecting traditions again. Comes back. Oh, king, live forever! Actually, God, for your kingdom, raised up a mighty father, Avraham. And in his descendants, he promised the kingdom. But those people experienced a great famine. Yet one of the children of that, uh, of, of that uh, mighty father, one of his great-grandchild, rescued the people, Joseph, by bringing them to Egypt, where there was a good pharaoh. But after that good pharaoh died, they forgot about it, they enslaved the people, and therefore God had to raise up Moses so that your kingdom would be established. O king, live forever. David liked his story a lot. But David was puzzled. Why would God choose, why would my God, the God of my fathers, Yahweh, the God of David, choose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph to do this among all the humans on earth? Uh, so the Yahweh has to go back again to the drawing board and collect traditions and work on it again. And he does. And he comes back and he says, O king, live forever! Now he has a new beginning to the story. Yahweh, the God of David, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, at the beginning of creation, created human beings, humankind, Hadam, Ish and Isha, man and woman. But they shamed him with a mischievous talking snake. And because they did that, humankind fell into shame. But God had not abandoned humankind, so he raised up eventually Abraham, and even after a flood, and there was a three-part story, and David liked it very much. That is the very beginning of the Old Testament I just gave it to you. Everything around those, that, that three-part story, which originally in context was written as a theological explanation, umpire number three, to explain and express how the Davidic Empire came about, was established, and everything else grows out of that story as an interpretation, as a server joinder, as a no, that's not true, as a no, it's like this. And when you begin to see that construction, you see the library that becomes the Old Testament evolve. Well, David passed on the kingdom to Solomon, but it wasn't long. Solomon was associated with wisdom, but he actually was one of the most foolish characters in the whole Bible in history, biblical history. He lost the kingdom. When he died, the kingdom split to north and south. The tribes up in the north, do you think that they were pro-David and pro the God of David, Yahweh? No way! No freaking way! They're not going to theologize stories about David and the origin of Israel with David's God. No, they're going to be interested in El, the supreme God of the sky vault, the high God. That's their God, the supreme God of the Canaanite pantheon. And Elohim, his big Downton Abbey in the sky. And for 200 years, that kingdom had competing theologies with the kingdom in the south. But the Assyrian Empire came along, and in 721 BCE, sacked 
the northern kingdom. Refugees flooded south, and guess what they brought along with them? Stories and the name of God, Elohim. And that's why in the Old Testament you have God sometimes being referred to as Elohim, El, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. Is this making sense what I'm saying? Umpire number three. Umpire number one can't take this, folks. Umpire number one cannot take this. Umpire number one, I call it as it is. But you gotta know what it is before you can call it as it is. Umpire number two doesn't care about this either. Oh, come on, this is too much. Kumbaya, I'm gonna hold hands. Theology on tap has to be theology on tap. And we're doing biblical theology now. We're grappling with other people grappling with holy and absolute mystery we call God. You know, God's a German word. Gott, the good, that which is desirable, that which is delightful, that which is valuable. In other words, being loved. But that's a Western way of thinking. It's part of the picture. Uh, keeps on evolving. You know, when you start getting your derriere kicked <coughs> enough times, you realize you're not the best thing in the, in the world. And that also gives another perspective. So you have a set of books being formed that are the earliest form of the Bible uh, by a group of people called the Deuteronomists, who were priests under the employee of a Davidic descendant named Josiah, who wanted to get rid of all those unauthorized shamanic figures, those women up in the hills, Expressing God in feminine ways. <laughs> By the way, I don't like Dan Brown or Da Vinci Code. But this part is true. They can't have that. Mm -mm -mm. So we destroy all those high places. Now David's dream is finally true. We got the central sanctuary. Too bad Babylon's coming. All right, now we got that central sanctuary. All right, everything's all right. Now when we have that, let's write. Let's find a book. Oh, look, Moses. He he wrote a book. Well, he, he didn't really write a book. It was actually the Deuteronomy that wrote it. But that's all right. The book is called, by now, what we call it, Deuteronomy. And it was the first part of a set of books that was a very clever criticism against the kings, called the Deuteronomic History. And those are the earliest books we have in the Bible. Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings. That is the original library of the Bible. Remember the Yahweh's old story? Those were oral still, and written in annals that we no longer have. You won't really see them get incorporated into the merging, evolving Bible until after Babylon around 400 BCE, when another group of priests, interpreting the situations of history differently, comes back and says, let's fit this story in here, let's fit that story in there, and that's why you have different details about Noah's Ark, sometimes it's 40 days it rains, sometimes it's so many more days it rains. You know, if Western people had wrote this, we wouldn't mess this up like this, come on. We would have had editors and people working on this and changing it, it would have been a little bit better. But then again, Western people don't write the Bible. The Bible wasn't written for, by, or about Western people, was it? It was written by Middle Eastern, North African personalities. Can God use that? Can God use Middle Eastern, North African personalities? Why not? He already did. Amen. In fact, we've got to take the in in inspiration very seriously, the prefix in. And we got to take the in in incarnation very seriously. Into what? Into our time? You do that, yes, today, but not in the Bible. You read our way of looking at things into the Bible, you're committing identity theft on Jesus and our biblical ancestors in the faith. I wouldn't call that respect. Now, Catholics are very keen on this point right here I'm going to make. We believe that we are in continuity with Jesus and his movement. Amen? We believe that the church is in continuity. Amen. That's apostolic continuity with apostolic succession. We believe that, right? Yes, yes we do. Yes. All right. Understand that doesn't mean something static. Continuity, yes, but with evolution. Within evolution. Because everything evolves in this world. God doesn't evolve, but our views of God evolve. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But not our theologies. Right now, we're 2,000 years into the history of the church. But if the church goes on for another 20,000 years, then we're in the infancy of the church right now. Something to think about. Whenever you move the language, you necessarily change the meaning. 
That's true also with all the words we find in the Bible. So inspired doesn't mean God dictated it. Because there is no language form, not Arabic and not Latin, not Greek and not Hebrew, not Aramaic, but not English. There's no, or Spanish, any language. So we have a translator here to prove back me up. There's no, sorry, it's putting it to work already. There's no, there's no language form on earth that is perfect and, uh, and just completely articulates everything in a perfect way. It's always metaphor. It's always analogy. It's always limited by culture and history and situation. Not our dogmatic language. Yes, our dogmatic language too. We have a teaching in the church. Extra ecclesia nulla salus. Outside the church, no salvation. Amen. Sure. But I guarantee you, we no longer accept that the way the Pope who first promulgated that did. We don't really believe that like that. Go ask Father Feeney, who was excommunicated before Vatican II, for saying that you ought to be saved, extra ecclesia nulla salus, your name has to be on the baptismal registry of a Catholic church, baby. Otherwise, you don't get saved. You know what the Vatican did? Pope Pius XII excommunicated. We don't teach that. That's not what extra ecclesia nulla salus means. Even our dogmatic formula is still subject to the human limitations of all human communication forms. And inspiration is magical. It doesn't change the Hebrew or change the Greek or your English and Spanish translations into something magical and untouchable by history and time. On the contrary, God's love is blessed. You gave an example once about that no ancient writing contains any word for the color blue. That's in, right. Uh, ancient from a certain point. Right. Right. Uh, in Anywhere fact, it's in the, in the world. Bible. The Bible calls the sea wine colored. Go to the Hopi Indians. They only have two words for color. And that means what? They only perceive reality in two colors. You look at their dress, they have all these different colors. We can see. But you see, culture shapes what you can perceive, what you can understand, what you can think about, and what you can talk about. All. A theology is analogy. And all analogy is rooted in human experience. And all human experience. That's St. Thomas Aquinas. And all human experience becomes the cultural anthropology. All human experience is culturally specific. How am I doing my time, Danny? You got six minutes. Beautiful. <laughs> so this brings us to this is a, I want this to be like starting point. After the vicissitudes of being conquered by Babylon and Persia. Look at the ideas that come in with Persians. Suddenly we have the first monotheism come in. Monotheism is a great idea. It comes from Zoroaster. The Persians could come up with that because, see, they had one emperor. That one emperor was an analog for one god. But, you know, it didn't really catch on. The earliest monotheism we have in our Bible is Isaiah chapter 40 through 55. Somebody gets a star. When do we read that? those chapters, especially? What time of year? This I happens. Guess. Huh? I you're thinking of the manual song. What time? That's early, early. That's Isaiah 11. When do we read Isaiah 40 through 55? The servant songs. We just read them. <coughs> Holy, Holy Week, baby. Holy Week. Huh? Behold my servant. Right? Lent. That's when we read it. Exactly. Holy Week. All right. So, monotheism. You find monotheism there. You find monotheism there. Everywhere else is mostly henotheism. What do you mean, Bill? I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. You shall have no other gods before me. That's monotheism. No, it's not. I shall have no other gods before you. Okay, God, no problem. No other, I won't worship any other gods, but there are other gods, right? That's henotheism. Later on, interpreted through traditions, Islam and, and of course, Judaism and, 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 and Christianity, it becomes interpreted monotheistically and rather severely monotheistically in the Jewish articulation of it. You know, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord alone, doesn't necessarily demand monotheism. It could be henotheism. Here's another one. The Satan. Remember I said that 950 B.C., when the Yahweh, David's storyteller, is writing about that talking snake, it's just a mischievous talking snake. You know, that's what a mischievous talking snake does. What do you expect from a mischievous talking snake? <laughs> it hadn't yet evolved into being the devil. See, the mischievous talking snake was one thing. Satan, right? Satan, right? <laughs> thus is actually the Satan first. It's an office, a Middle Eastern office. 
a Persian office. It comes from Persian thought. See, what the Satan is, is not a, he's not an evil guy. Now, when the Ayatollah Khomeini calls the United, called the United States the Satan, he wasn't actually insulting us. He was saying, we're real, the great Satan. He was actually saying, watch out, they're, they're, they're evil, but they're very dangerous and smart. That's what he actually was saying. We didn't understand that, did we? Because we're thinking of like, you know, like some kind of devil. He's not thinking that. He's thinking Hashatan, this older concept. So let me give you an example from the modern Middle East. The Satan originally is a James Bond. He's a guy who's a secret agent. And he goes and he tests the loyalty of the subjects of the king. So he'll go to one of the subjects of the king and he'll say, how's it like living under the king? You know, he'll get a friendship going. And then once the friendship's established and the guy lures his guard and he says to the Satan, not knowing he's sick because he's disguised, oh, that king sucks, you know, he sucks. I'm a man of the king. And then he's under arrest. So King Hussein of Jordan, when he took the throne, he did that. He dressed up like a regular guy. Peasants started talking to the peasants, the Jordanian peasants. And then, he, and then when they revealed the, the, the good and the bad, he revealed himself and said, thank you for being such a loyal citizen. That's a modern articulation of the Satan. So in Job, the book of Job, that's the Satan. Not an evil guy in Job. He's not Satan, he's the Satan. Read the text, it'll show it to you. And he's a guy, he's a secret agent, and he's working like James Bond for the man upstairs, okay, and he's trying to like see what's going on down here, and he's putting Job to a test, and it's a wonderful comedy about how our wisdom tradition doesn't have all the answers. Because people suffer not only because they do bad, because sometimes it just happens. Job is a magnificent worker. So understand, at the time the book of Job was written, and I'm going to close with this, Satan was one thing, the Satan. Talking mischievous snake was another thing. Devil was another thing, that's another Persian idea. And the constellation in the sky, called Scorpio uh, Libra, was another thing. But when 500 years go by, and the book, author of the book of Revelation writes Revelation, all those four things became one. Now the Satan committed a coup d'etat in Sky Vault, and because of that he got thrown into the lower Sky Vault, the dragon with seven heads, that's the constellation Scorpio, there's the tail, Libra, which is biting a woman, the only constellation in the zodiac that's a woman, a pregnant woman, Virgo, which tells you that the word virgin meant something different in the first century than it does now, because it was a pregnant virgin. How interesting how things change. Whenever you move the language, you necessarily change the meaning. Be careful with umpire number two. Be careful with umpire number one. We must strive to be umpire number three in Mother Church. Thank you for your patience. All right. We're going to take a five-minute break. If you need to use the restroom, it's back there to the... Uh,